All right, so today's topic is um, tools that you can use to deliver blended online instruction. And um, I will be your main presenter. My name is Rachel McBain. I am a teacher mentor here at Graduation Alliance. Um, April Barton and Don Kuhlman have also contributed to this presentation. They are online teachers with us and have um, extensive cur uh, curriculum development experience as well. Um, so they are excellent resources for some of the, the Q&A that we'll have at the end um, and any of the tidbits as we go along here. Today we're going to talk about identifying the types of learning that are best suited for um, asynchronous and synchronous delivery methods. So that live time that you have students on a platform with you and when they're away from you, where is the, the learning going to happen and how. Um, tips for learning and managing those synchronous sessions, those live sessions, how do you just keep it organized and going, flowing along smoothly and the free tools that you have available um, to help support you in this endeavor. At the end, we will have a Q&A with our online teachers, um, and then we will actually also have a secondary session um, I will talk more about at the end, but there will be an open office hour period where if you have specific questions about tech curriculum or working with um, students or teachers online, um, we will have some resources available for you there, so stay tuned. To jump right into this, um, really it's about framing some of those questions that relate to the big picture. Um, before you can really jump straight into online learning um, and have a successful go at it, you really want to start with some of these questions that are going to help frame your intentions. The first ones are just, what is your learning target? What are you hoping your students are going to get out of these lessons? Um, does a student need to actually learn something new or do they need to demonstrate that they have learned something already? Uh, so it's this twofold performance outcome. And then what should the student be able to do after the interaction? And that interaction can be either with you in real time, or it can be the student interacting with the learning material, but it's what are you wanting the student to be able to accomplish when you turn them loose at the end of the day? So using these questions to frame your decision making in that big picture um, reality is what's going to help you get going on this. Talking about asynchronous versus synchronous, I'm just throwing those words around. Um, I want to do this chart here and break down what these words really even mean um, in terms of the context of the classroom. Um, the asynchronous is really that time the student spends either away from you, away from the computer even maybe. It's the time that the student is spending doing independent work um, that is not bound by the time and space of either the classroom building or even that online computer time. Um, there are different types of learning that can take place with that delivery. Um, and that's where this chart lays out some of those opportunities for how it's beneficial, how you might use it, and some of those specific examples. Um, synchronous, on the other hand, is it's what we're doing here right now. It's that time that you have your um, students available to you. It's not quite face to face, but close enough. Um, and you're able to do maybe some teacher facilitated lessons. You're having those class discussions that, and more of that open forum in real time. And both of them do have value and a place in learning. It's a matter of just identifying how and why you're going to use them. So this chart um, will be available. We are recording these slides and you can look back at it for more specific examples. Um, but I wanted to start with just laying out um, some of this broken down in, so that it can guide the rest of our discussion today. Okay, so now I wanna do a bit of an icebreaker with all of you and just ask you some of these questions that are probably swirling around in your brain um, and in relation to this discussion. What factors are influencing how you will choose the methods for delivering your content, whether it's asynchronous or synchronous or both? And then which of those factors do you find to be the most challenging? Go ahead and just type your answers in the chat. We'll wait a little bit for people to shout them out in here, um, you know, textually. And then hopefully this presentation will help you get some more um, solid ideas to help guide that thinking. Okay, so we have uh, the one factor influencing is just connecting with students online. Um, the most challenging is too many choices. That's fair. There are a lot of tools and a lot of options. Um, learning targets, instruction for special education, whether it's project-based or not, lots of good answers here. Um, ease of access technology, Wow, 
Lots and lots here. Oh, this is a good one. Math is hard to teach in person. Can't imagine teaching online. April is our resident math teacher and she has some tools that might really, really help you um, with accomplishing, um, connecting that learning with the students. Engaging ways for second graders to stay tuned in, online physical education. Um, lots of answers revolve around technology, whether it's a variety of um, access or just the sheer volume of it. There are so many tools out there um, and a lot of them are free right now. So it, it's probably a little overwhelming trying to decide which ones to even use. Um, we will lay out some tools and um, we do have them broken down by categories on how you can use them. Um, so hopefully that will help cut down on if you're feeling overwhelmed by just what do you even start with. Um, that can give you some, some grounding information. Students being able to learn at home, the time difference, how long they should spend. Um, lots of good answers in here, okay? So this presentation will hopefully address at least some of these topics that you have shared. And then remember, like I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, at the very end, there will be some open office hour time. So maybe in small groups, there can be some brainstorming, sharing resources and working with um, some of our leadership team that can help provide some guidance on um, what we've found works and even doesn't work. Um, so hopefully we'll get you where you need to be and we're all in this together. So let's keep going with this. Thank you so much for sharing all of those, um, those factors and your own challenges because they are very valuable and very real. Um, it's, it's, we're all kind of in the same boat um, and figuring out how to guide Switching from brick and mortar to online overnight is not a small feat, so we recognize that. So moving forward with this, let's talk about how we even split up the, the synchronous versus asynchronous teaching um, and how to start making those decisions. I would encourage you to consider these three driving questions as the ones that are going to help motivate the decision making process for you because they're really tied to the outcome. It's what do you want to accomplish? So starting with what's the purpose behind the learning objectives? Why do you have those learning objectives up? What do you want the student to get from them? Which really directly ties to number two, what are you hoping to change in the learner? And then based on what you're hoping to change, the third one is how do you assess that change? Especially when you don't have them in front of you and you can't see their faces when they're looking confused, how do you assess that? So we will provide some guidance on that, um, but I would encourage you to just consider the use case. What that really comes down to is how is your method of delivery going to accomplish and will it help or will it actually hinder what you're trying to do? And if you're answering those questions, and you're saying, yes, it'll help. Great. Go for it. If you're thinking it might hinder, what are some other options you can do to, um, to accomplish the same outcome? Okay. So from Going to, uh, sorry, last, last point on here is consider that 100% synchronous online does not have to be the go-to. Um, unless you have seat time required, think about how you can use a variety of tools to be efficient with your time and the, um, the, the structure really, because your students are spread now, they're all in their own homes. And so how do you still kind of collect them together and keep them on pace? So, that moves us into the temptation might be to either move all your content directly online and have students just read through the text or watch a bunch of videos or the opposite. It's host a web conference, get the students all together and just carry on kind of lecture style um, or try to maintain as much of a semblance of a brick and mortar classroom as possible. However, I would encourage you to consider blending those strategies by having a mix. It's going to make it easier for you because then you're not having to sit in front of a computer and talk for six to eight hours and hope that students are listening to you or vice versa. You're not turning them completely loose and hoping that they're reading text. If you can blend those strategies together and keep them moving towards those learning targets, that's what's going to have uh, you know, the ultimate success. Now, that's all good and well, but it's easier said than done. The challenge then comes down to how do we differentiate? When do we use asynchronous versus synchronous teaching and learning strategies and which approach do we use? So this is really the meat and potatoes of all of this. So for um, the next couple of slides, we're going to pass it and talk through 
the split between asynchronous delivery and synchronous delivery. Um, Dawn Kuhlman, who I mentioned in the beginning, she is not able to be here live for this presentation, but she is uh, very skilled at our curriculum development and has done some very creative things with our Spanish courses um, to get students engaged in some, some of those tools that may help you. Especially, um, some of you mentioned yesterday that um, elementary school students really struggle with typing and audio might be an easier solution for them. One of these tools, um, which Don did record an explanation and a demo of that I will play for you, may help you um, with this, this challenge. So asynchronous delivery is um, really best geared for independent practice type work, um, math problems, if they need to write an essay, things that they can do independently on their own time, still having due dates and deadlines around that, but allowing them to do it throughout the day um, when it works for them is great. Any kind of discussion board that can be video or text or audio where students are recording themselves and responding to their peers, that can be done um, asynchronously and even peer review. That one, you have more options. Um, peer review, you can do asynchronously where you could say uh, students have to submit their drafts to a discussion board and over the next couple of days, they need to find a peer draft, download it, leave some constructive critique and then share it back to their peer. Um, or it could be done synchronously in pairs. So there are options here, okay? I am seeing some chat messages, so I wanna check that before playing our video and see if we're all caught up. Okay. Looks like a little bit of group brainstorm. So no questions um, or comments specific to this quite yet. So let's take a look at um, Screencastify and Vocaroo. First one, Screencastify. It's very easy to get. Uh, you download it and it shows up on your browser and then you're able just to click the button and mine's recording now obviously, but up here's the button where it would say record and then you're able to make videos. One thing that I use it for a lot is explaining things to my students like final projects when I want them to be able to see examples while I'm talking and not just read a long paragraph about what they need to do. So I made this video, I teach Spanish and they had a big final project. So I recorded this in the video, it tells them what the project is all about, the requirements, what I'm looking for grade wise, and then in the end I kind of explain how I would suggest they they go about completing it. So I'm going to play just a minute of it for you so you can see what the students saw. So this is it, your final project for Spanish One Semester One. You are going to pretend that you are going on a job interview for your dream job. But instead of a resume, the company you are interviewing with wants you to create a video introducing yourself to them. In unit one, we learned a lot of different ways to do this. Your second slide should be your likes and dislikes. So you can see that I really used this to explain to the students what to do and how to do it and what to expect. And I think that uh, it works a little bit better than just writing things out because when you're not with your students and you can't get in front of them and talk, a lot of things end up being just written down. And it's real easy to miss things or skim or we have students that may just, you know, not read as thoroughly. So I think a video really helps. Also, another way that I obviously use Screencastify is then for the students to create projects for me. So for this project, they then had to make a PowerPoint and use Screencastify to record themselves giving the presentation and sending it to me. The second thing, um, you can see a theme. I, I really like audio. I also teach Spanish, so maybe that has something to do with it. But a lot of times when we're not with our students, it's a lot of back and forth emails, texting, and this is a way to record your voice and easily send it. So, this can be, this is what it looks like. Very simple to use, vocaroo.com. You click the record button and you start talking. You say whatever you need to say and then stop. And this is the link that the students will either share with you or they could share it to a discussion board. 
if they were talking about maybe something that you asked them to read, paste it into the browser and you start talking, you say whatever you need to say, and then, and there you go. So it's a really easy way to exchange uh, audio. And I like to use this a lot when I ask students to respond to something. Obviously, writing is important, but if you just want them to give their opinion and respond, I tend to get a lot more details and um, a lot longer of an answer, I'll say, when I just tell them to record themselves. So you could have your students read an article and then send you the most interesting thing that they learned from the article. Or you could have them post it to a discussion board and their classmates get to listen to them. So that's a real easy way to do that. Okay, so those are just some of the tools that um, you can use to do some of this asynchronous delivery. Some questions came through in the chat, um, and one of them is about um, the challenge of using uh, formative data um, in relation to all of this and you know, doing asynchronous versus synchronous learning. How do we retrieve that feedback from students, the observation collaboration pieces? Um, so the short answer is tomorrow's topic will cover that actually in detail. Um, it's all about formative and summative assessments in an online environment. Um, we have one of our full-time online teachers who does a lot of curriculum development, has some very creative ways that she manages it in her class, so she'll share some of those examples. Um, but for the time being, what I would encourage is, in relation to this asynchronous piece, is um, when you are developing your online work, consider that not every single I'll say activity instead of assignment because they don't all have to be graded for an actual formal assessment versus some practice problems sprinkled in throughout so that you can collect some feedback as students are working through the material and you can see where they're getting stuck. If they're doing, let's say, a math unit and they're doing practice problems, going through some lesson pages, whether it's done through lecture style or you've sent them home with some practice text, um, if you can get those uh, practice problem responses and see, you know, maybe the first three problems, the majority of the class is doing great, and then they all hit a wall at problem number four, what's going wrong at that point? Or if they're all over the place, that's where you'll have to assess and figure out, you know, what's the, the, the main cause for the confusion. Okay, so we will go through that in more detail, like I said, tomorrow, but I just, I did want to get, uh, you know, at least an answer out there for you. Um, in terms of some other resources, Quizlet is a great one that Dawn has um, incorporated in her Spanish class. In the interest of time, I will skip her video, but I will share it out with um, the, the slides with the recording like you received earlier today. Um, the recording of this webinar will include these videos and a handout that summarizes all the tools we've talked about, links to them, and ideas for how you can use them. So you will have a reference guide instead of just trying to absorb what I'm saying to you and just taking and running with it, you will be able to pull that up and, and refer back to it. So um, Quizlet, just very briefly, is a, uh, it's a tool where you can create sets that students can use flashcards uh, for practice. You can assign quizzes as actual assessments. Um, and there's actually live quizzes that you can do almost like group trivia as a class. So there's multiple ways you can use it. And students can even create their own flashcards. So there's quite a variety and Don does talk through some ideas for it. So I would encourage you to look through that, um, but we will move on for the time being. So we just covered asynchronous delivery methods. Um, I'm going to turn the mic to April Barton here, our resident math teacher to talk about synchronous delivery. Um, she has some very helpful tools that she's going to demo as well. Yeah, stop sharing your screen and I will share mine. I'm not going to make my slides full screen um, because I'm going to be moving away from the slides in a minute. And just to double check, can people actually hear me? Make sure the sound did transfer over. Okay, thank you. So we're gonna talk about synchronous delivery. I do a lot of online tutoring sessions with students as part of my job. 
Um, I might be able to turn my microphone volume up and I will also try just putting it closer. Is that any better? Okay, I moved it closer to my mouth. Um, so synchronous delivery, um, it's good if you need individual in-depth discussion with students when you want to do just individual tutoring. Sometimes like you might do after school. I was a high school teacher in a brick and mortar building for a while. So that's when I always held tutoring or, you know, if you're doing in class practice, you might have done individual help. You can also do small group sessions if you need to focus on one specific group. Um, if you just feel like the material may be too complex to deliver asynchronously, if there, it's not easy to just watch a video and understand, you might need to do this. Um, or I saw a couple of chats about parents. You might even hold a synchronous delivery session with parents to make sure they're understanding the technology or understanding expectations. I know it's not a normal tactic in regular teaching, but at this point, We've got to go kind of abnormal and use all that we can, including getting the parents on board with what you want to do and how you want to deliver it. <laughs> so it sounds like my volume is still pretty low. Um, so some of these questions I don't know to the answer to yet, so we'll have to think about answers to some of these. Okay, so everyone else is saying they can hear me loud and clear. That's good. Um, and it might be a good idea to have a district level or a classroom of level, level for parents. Um, so most people can hear me fine. If you are not hearing me fine, try turning up or down your individual volume, and that can probably help as well. Um, so going on to holding synchronous sessions, um, to schedule sessions and to have individual sessions, then Sometimes, honestly, I just text students. This doesn't work as well with elementary because they don't have cell phones, but sometimes I literally just tutor via text. I answer questions with text. I don't like giving out my personal number, so I have a Google Voice number, which is free, um, and that's what I give out. And then I can also work on my computer and type my text messages, which is a little bit quicker. I'm a little bit slow when I text on my phone. Um, depending on the level of technology a student might be comfortable with, sometimes I do a phone call with an online whiteboard. Um, it's literally just a whiteboard where both of you can write on it, and this way they can also participate and write on the whiteboard. It does help if you have an external mouse because writing with like a trackpad on a laptop can be difficult. It's possible. It's going to look really bad. Um, you can do phone call and screen sharing. Sometimes, like a Zoom session like this, students can't get the sound to work, so I use a phone call and this instead. Um, or just Zoom itself, where you use the online meeting program for, for sound and for screen sharing. Um, for group sessions, you really only have that online meeting program. Uh, option. So for the online meeting program, it's the best way to get a group together. Um, if you know how to do like a group phone call and a whiteboard, you can invite people to a whiteboard. I did see a question about the whiteboard. I'm actually going to show you some of the resources I use in just a minute. That's why I didn't go full screen on my slides. Um, but if you're using like your Zoom tool, just like we're recording, it's a great um, it's a great tool um, to record and then upload to YouTube so that students can rewatch for their own understanding or even if they've been there and want to watch it again. So I'm going to move on to some of the resources. Um, my two slides were mostly just covered by what I was talking and they will be included when we send them out. So one of my favorite resources for scheduling individual tutoring sessions is Calendly. You can, let me zoom in a little bit so that we can maybe see this a little bit bigger. It's free to use. Um, and it's a way for students to literally just schedule events with you. You can connect it to your Google Calendar and it will automatically populate your Google Calendar and 
let you know when is a good time for students to chat with you when it works for them. When you try to schedule via text or email, then it's difficult because you suggest a time, they say, no, I can't this time. Like you're, there's a lot of back and forth. So I like this because they can literally just look at it and pick a time. When you start, you have a premium version where there's three different meeting options. Eventually it will go down to just one meeting option. Um, so lots of good ideas for other meeting functions or appointment scheduling things on the chat as well. Um, when you want to change your times or any of the questions, you click on the gear to edit and you can change the names. You can add if you want to use a specific phone number or specific Zoom link. You can add all that in. Um, you can change when they can book and what times when you initially set it up. I just set this one up from nine to five. You can build into your calendar when you're available. And you can even change down below some questions, you know, not just their name and email, but you can add new questions of what do you want to talk about? How should I contact you? So it's a great feature. What they will see is this. You give them the link. Um, I selected that 15 minute meeting link. So it's just that set up. You can't pick 30 or 60 if you select that specific link. They select a day, they select the time zone, and they select an individual time, and then they just fill out their data and it automatically will populate on your calendar. Um, for the whiteboard, there's a lot of those out there as well. Um, my favorite has been a web whiteboard. It's literally called a web whiteboard. Um, there's one out there called web whiteboard. So there's a lot of them out there. I like this one the best. Um, I usually have the easiest time getting students to use it. So what if they don't have a working email? I'm going to go back to that question. Um, then you're going to have to focus on how can you contact them. Sometimes it's what can I do to contact these students. If they don't have an email, Calendly will not be a great option. Maybe texting parents, maybe sending parents the Calendly link to schedule it. So you've just got to be flexible and look through what can I do to contact these students. Um, and usually for students who are too young to have an email or something, it's working through their parents or having their parents set them up an email. So back to the whiteboard. Um, on the whiteboard to get a link out, you could copy it from the top or you can just hit collaborate and copy the link. And I'm gonna just pop this into the chat. If anyone wants to join me, You'll um, see when you join, you have to click join shared board and it'll make you type in your name. And there's actually a chat feature or no, it just, sorry, not a chat feature, but it does just populate with who is here. So you can join and have multiple people in the room at once and multiple people writing things down. I am a math teacher, so I'm used to writing math equations in these. And you can just write it out if you don't have a screen sharing, they can join this without a screen sharing tool and still be seeing what you're writing. And it has lots of features as well of, as of on its own. You can type text into it. They have a few shape features. Sometimes I upload a document and write directly onto the document. Sometimes when I'm screen sharing in Zoom though, I just use the annotation tools that Zoom provide. Um, sometimes that's actually the better option. Sometimes I just want to focus on a document and I want to be writing all over it. So instead of utilizing the whiteboard, I utilize Zoom and screen share so that I can annotate on that as well. So we did have someone join. If you feel like writing something up there, you can write onto the whiteboard. You have to hold your mouse button down as you write and make sure you are on the pen button to actually write on it. So this one's my favorite. There's lots of them out there. Um, search for your favorite. If you like it, you can use it. If you don't like it, 
So we will run into the issue. I usually have me and one student, but now that we have multiple people, we're gonna get lots of things on this board. So that's another issue you might run into is how do I limit it to only the person I need to be writing at the time to write? And someone's pretty good at math. They're solving this equation pretty well. Um, so I think that covers all my tools. I guess you could use a whiteboard for asynchronous testing. You could have a student write something out, but they can do other things. Oh, um, so cell phone only, I would say Zoom is one of the best for cell phone. If you're looking like for an actual learning management system where students join a classroom, something like Google Classroom or Schoology, um, if your district has one, like when I worked in a brick and mortar, we used Canvas that they paid for. So something like that can actually be accessed on a student's cell phone. So whiteboard might not be the best option for cell phone, but Zoom is a great option for cell phone. Um, a lot of Google products can still be accessed via cell phone. A lot of our students still use their, their cell phones for a lot of things because it's what most people have access to. Oh, I did forget one thing. Another option is, at least when I was in brick and mortar, I had a lot of access to document cameras. So I'm gonna see if I can, I'm not the usual presenter, so I'm not sure I can bring my document camera up. Let me see if it shows when I push stop share. Manage professional. Oh, here we go. It's under your video. Nope, wrong one. I put both. Here we go. So another option is record videos in Zoom using your document camera um, or just you know writing stuff down like Sometimes that's what I used in my classroom was write it down from the document camera and it showed on the big screen. Okay, I think I missed one question of how to join the board. It's just a link. You hit collaborate and you copy the link. The students should just be able to click the link. Okay, and I think we're ready to go back to Rachel. Thank you, April. Let me get my screen share back up. And back to our presentation. Yeah, so some other ideas in the chat. There's um, a document camera. If you have access to one, um, it just, it's, it reflects what you are, um, what you have on your desk or on, you know, it's a, it's a document reader that would then project basically. Um, or the other suggestion is to put a whiteboard under the document camera. So if you have a whiteboard at home um, or handy, then you could use that instead of traditional pen and paper. So um, moving on from here, just some tips for managing those synchronous sessions. Um, you know, it could be a little bit overwhelming. It's, it's one thing to be able to stand in front of students and get them to quiet down and stuff, but when they're on their screens and doing who knows what, um, how do you manage those live sessions with large groups? The big one, which, you know, we've already seen um, here is just muting. It's, it's keeping students muted unless they need to talk. Um, because we've all been in those conference calls where it's just crazy and everyone's talking over each other and the background noise and all of that. Um, so making sure that whatever conferencing tool you use has a um, host enabled uh, mute setting that you can control and turn students on or off with their, their microphones, um, that is going to be key. The rest of these uh, tips are, they may seem pretty obvious, but thinking about in a brick and mortar classroom, it comes pretty naturally that that classroom management piece, knowing that you need to keep a structure and those ground rules, but moving into online, um, there's, as teachers, we wanna focus on the lesson content. We get so excited about sharing that, that it might be easy to forget about some of those more tech pieces. Um, so just like you would in the, in the brick and mortar, setting those ground rules for students. And what does that look like in the online environment? How do they participate? How do you want them communicating with you? Do you even want them to use a mic or do you want them 100% on chat? Those kinds of things, um, having some ground rules for the students, it'll help you keep your sanity and it'll help the students understand what's expected of them and for them to have a positive experience. 
Um, if you have a group session, um, if you're not doing one focused lesson, but you're trying to help multiple students, maybe doing some math tutoring, for example, if you have a web conferencing tool that has breakout rooms, um, Zoom is one of them, you can actually split students up. And this is basically a virtual desk space. Um, and we call it hover, don't park. So you spend time with each student, but it's not consistent spending 10, 15 minutes with a student um, and then not being able to get to the rest of your class. It's you get a student started on the problem or whatever they're stuck on, move on to another student, get second student started, then go back to that first one and check on their progress. It's keeping them moving and keeping a flow going. And then the last piece is it's really that battle of time that we all experience is that giving appropriate wait time, giving appropriate work time, but without losing the students, you know, giving them too long so they get distracted, but still giving them enough time to process, think, and apply um, while still sticking to that agenda. So um, it's easy, you know, sometimes tangents come up and falling into those black holes um, is kind of a, a danger. So keep, keeping to that, that calendar that you have scheduled for if you have a synchronous session and you have just a certain amount of time planned, um, sticking with that is going to help too. Um, some of the free tools that can help you out. This is just a summary. Like I said, there is a handout that does explain um, which tools are useful for which delivery method um, with some suggestions and links. Um, but for synchronous tools, pretty much anything in the Google uh, suite, you have Google Classroom, Google Meet, or Hangouts, so you may have heard of it uh, called either or. Um, Calendly that April demonstrated and uh, web whiteboards you can do at the same time sharing with students. Um, start meeting or Zoom. And then for asynchronous, you would need some kind of recording technology. Um, if you wanted to send out videos, you know, maybe some mini lectures or something to your students. Screencast-O-Matic and Screencastify are both very easy to use. Um, you can record yourself, download your videos, upload them to YouTube, and just push out a link to your students. Um, I talked about Quizlet. That's the um, assessment tool or flashcard review option. TED Ed, which has short videos with assessments already built at the end of some of those videos that you can share out. And then Soft Chalk is a lesson editor tool that is free right now as well for cloud. So um, these are all ways that you students. Okay. So some final takeaways from all of this is um, that while there are a lot of options, um, and like many of you said, that that's just kind of an overwhelming piece of all this is which options do I even start with? Just go back to those main questions from the beginning of what am I trying to accomplish with my students? And once you have that built out and have the big picture, it's how do I get there? What, what tools are going to get me from A to B and show that my students have some learning? So blending those synchronous and asynchronous elements will really help you do that. It gives variety. Um, you can maintain your clear expectations and then also just allowing students opportunities to learn away from the computer. It doesn't have to be completely away from the computer, but it can also just be in their own space. It's away from these you know, live platforms, um, but it could also be something as simple as for a science lesson, have them go in the backyard, collect some data, and then come back and report on it. Um, there are some options to get them away from staring at a computer screen for you know, eight hours a day. So. I would encourage you to use some of these tools and, and come up with some variety to keep students motivated. Um, especially I saw in the chat earlier, there was some, some comment about students are very hands-on and keeping them engaged, you know, keeping them moving. Um, that variety will help with the engagement piece. So that brings us to our Q&A. Um, I did see some questions popping up in the chat. So let's go back to those. I'm going to try to address the questions that are specific to the content that we've covered so far. And then remember that we are going to um, switch to the open office hours um, in just a few minutes here. Okay, looking back at the chat here. Any strategies for increasing participation? Yes, so um, one, of, one of the participants shared it was some ideas on an increasing participation. Um, getting students involved, is, it's also about that accountability piece, which unfortunately there's not a, a magic recipe that will guarantee success. 
Um, it's trying those different outreach methods. So like April suggested between Calendly and texting and using supporters, finding who is going to help that student stay motivated. Sometimes it's a parent, sometimes it's a big brother. Sometimes it's a matter of asking that student, like who is and who in your life is going to keep you on track if you struggle with your, you know, keeping yourself going. Um, and then, you know, is it okay if I contact your brother about your, your schoolwork? Um, and just using the people that are, that have access to that student to help you. Uh, okay, so one question about the things I do at school will transfer. Any suggestions to push kids online and on a schedule? Um, part of it is just, it's asking them, what are you doing with your day and getting them to create their own schedule. Part of it is that those asynchronous elements, giving students the freedom to choose, but also maintain that clear expectation. You need to do something during the day. It's okay if it's not at 8 a.m., but if it's 10 a.m., you're going to have, you know, solid work time, then that's when you need to be working. Those are many of the same types of questions about um, getting students engaged and getting them online. Okay. So the last question, can you show us how to mute all students and prevent them from sharing the screen or is that a different webinar? Um, so Jean, it depends on which web conferencing you're using. On Zoom specifically, um, under Manage Participants, there's, an op there's a button to mute all, and there's also a checkbox for um, you can mute participants upon entry. Most web conferencing tools will have similar features. You may have to look in at maybe a different place, you know, a different drop down menu, um, but they should have a pretty apparent uh, mute all or similar feature. All right. So I want to, um, April, if you can unmute and, and chime in on this too. You know, one of these questions, how do you suggest we help 140 plus kids a day? Push is a pun, push is used for notifications. <laughs> I love puns actually. So that was a, that was a good add on. Um, but April, can you talk about how you manage, you know, your, your population and motivating those students to really connect? Let me check my. Helps if I unmute myself. Sorry about that. Um, so try splitting it up and not contacting all 140 kids or 245 a day individually. You can send out group messages. Um, if you're going to send a group email, make sure to blind carbon copy so students' privacy is preserved. Um, or I saw someone suggest Remind 101 earlier. You can send out group messages that way. Um, if you have some sort of meeting place where you've discussed how you're supposed to interact, you can use like a Slack group chat or find a way to do a group thing where you check in with everyone at once and then split it up and, you know, say I'm going to contact these many kids Monday and these many kids Tuesday and keep your individual contact to, a, you know, a manageable level every day. So you might not be able to help every single kid every single day, just like you can't really in your classroom. Um, also, to address more increased participation, you can try incorporating things kids like to do. Elementary students, they love Minecraft, so somehow incorporate that into a lesson. Uh, all kids love TikTok right now where they create these little viral vi videos. So have that incorporated somehow. I could see that be incorporated into like fitness. You could try that. Um, if you were to have a kid run their own Zoom, I would make them like a co-host. Technically, I'm not logged into like the host account. They just created or made me a co-host so I could present um, feasibility depends on your age group and their level of comfort with technology, but it is a great idea and you'd have to try it out and see how it worked. Sometimes it might fail, sometimes it might work. 
<laughs> what has been your favorite snack, your favorite show to watch? Bring your class day on Zoom. <laughs> Um, and then a question, school appropriate lessons, could you be a little more detailed? I'm not sure what you're meaning by that. I would say my favorite snack, by the way, is the white puff Cheetos. Those are pretty good. Any questions you want to take, Rachel? Uh, yeah, so Lauren, it looks like it was a follow up to Tom. So kind of keeping some control. So just like April said, it depends on your age group and maybe also a little bit of level of trust with, um, you know, giving the students to present, but that is also very powerful learning opportunities. So, you know, the student presenting would obviously have to be comfortable with the material. Um, and it gives the students a chance to learn from their peers and peer learning, um, you know, it, it's different, even though it's not it, like, the, it's still kind of that teacher feeling it's not that level, that person of authority, um, and it you know brings it down to the student's level. So, um, the short answer I would say yes to that, um, but it would also be you know considering the, the content of the material and how it relates to you know standards and such. Um, the questions about liability with using TikTok, things like that. That's going to depend on you know your school and district and what their um, you know privacy requirements might be and how they feel about social media. Um, and you know how it's it's controlled, and you know, who has access to the accounts and things like that. Um, and you could also say there's consequences for presenting inappropriate things. You know, set guidelines of what they what is appropriate for your classroom, and have consequences if they do something that's not appropriate. Yeah. 